Now we'll talk through the anatomy that's important to the pericardiocentesis procedure. So take a moment to think about where you would approach pericardiocentesis from the different uh, available options and, and pin the tail on the donkey here. So we could obviously go subcostally, apically or parasternally. Think about where that might be. Every cardiac textbook that describes pericardiocentesis is basically this same diagram showing you the various uh, approaches. And subcostally we can go around the xiphoid process. Apically, rather than just this dot here, we can go in a wide range so long as we're lateral to the internal mammary artery and this is really defined by the echo window you're a minimum here of six centimeters from the sternal border but i would almost always be substantially further around than that the parasternal approach you should be within a centimeter of the sternal border and you can even go on the right hand side i'll show you an example of that later in the presentation so we have the various anatomical structures, the sternum, the xiphisternum, and the ribs. And in particular, we have the internal mammary artery, which can have a variable course, but is close to the sternum and hence the need to be within a centimeter of the sternum. If I make that a little more transparent, can you see the left anterior descending artery also coming down in a very similar location? And this means that we need to be very, very careful if we're going parasternally that we don't damage the left anterior descending artery. And this is the reason for going in the fifth and sixth intercostal spaces. If I take that away altogether, you can see that more clearly. And if I put it back again, again, you can see why we would be going in these two spaces if we were going parasternally. Preferred options would be subcostally or apically staying well outside of the potential path of the internal mammary artery. If our approach takes us between the ribs, whether it's parasternally or apically, we do need to remember the anatomy of the chest wall and the fact that the neurovascular bundle tends to run at the lower border of each rib. So we should be aiming for the cephalid border of the rib. I love diagrams like this. They make it look like there's acres of space between the ribs and it often is not nearly so straightforward as that, but do feel for the upper border of the rib and stay as close to that as you can with your needle. I've talked a lot about the anatomy, but let's come back to thinking about the specific track that the needle is going to take. The tissues that it will pass through are not homogeneous. The first boundary is the skin, which tends to be relatively tough and often making a little nick in the skin can make that bit easier. They're the immediate subcutaneous tissues, which are often easy to pass through. But then you get tough fibrous tissue, particularly if you're going subcostally around the sternal margins and where the diaphragm meets the rib cage. So that can be quite difficult to get through and you'll certainly need the obturator in the pericardiocentesis needle if you're trying with a, a bluntish pericardiocentesis uh, needle to get through those tissues. Then you'll get to the pericardium and the pericardium is a tough fibrous sac and it can be very thickened and even harder and even calcified in somebody who's had a chronic pericardial effusion. But even in a normal healthy person, it's a relatively tough fibrous sac. And if your needle is approaching it directly, as in this example, it's potential, there's, there has the potential for your needle tip to push the pericardial sac up against the heart and the fluid will just dissipate to other parts of the pericardium. Now, if that happens, it's very easy to push the needle straight into the right ventricle because the right ventricle is a soft muscle. It's very much less tough than the pericardium. So when you go through the pericardium, it needs to be in a controlled manner. And uh, it's possible even when you're doing it as well as it can be done that 
your supposed one centimeter, two centimeters of pericardial space actually are zero space because the pericardium has been pushed against the heart. There's an entire section of this talk dedicated to knowing that your needle is in the right place. But if you aspirate blood, it's important not to suddenly pull the needle back thinking you need to start again, because all you need to do is retract the needle slightly. And as soon as the needle goes through the pericardial sac, it will pop back. And if you simply pull the needle back a centimeter or two, you can be within the pericardium and get your wire deployed. Where possible, it is better to approach the pericardiocentesis and the pericardium from a, an angle that allows you to penetrate a much greater depth of fluid. You can see that were you able to approach from this angle, which you might be able to do apically, you could advance the needle any distance you liked and never touch the heart. And this means that this situation where you're deforming the pericardium with your needle isn't an issue. So bear it in mind, it may not be possible if you're approaching uh, subcostally, but the whole reason for the shallow angle is to try to avoid a scenario where you're approaching the heart directly with the needle.